Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are worshiping with us today, and we'd love to know that you're here. So if you would, please take a moment and click either the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and let us know how we can be praying for you. In this new season, we're starting to try some different things here with our online worship. So I wanna let you know that this is gonna be a shorter service than uh, you might have gotten used to. Um, however, we will still have a full service available on Facebook. We are currently having a live recording of our 945 in-person service. So you can watch along starting at 945 on Facebook or anytime afterwards, you can watch it as well. Now I invite you to take a deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now as we pray together our opening congregational prayer. The words are on your screen. God of hope, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you taught us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to trust in you even when we can't see you working. In the sure and certain hope of your love, we offer ourselves to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. The water is deep and it's bitter cold, God's gonna trouble the water, it chills the body but warms the soul. God's gonna trouble the water, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. If you get there before I do, God's gonna trouble the water. Tell all of my friends that I'm coming to God's gonna trouble the water Wait in the water Wait in the water, children Wait in the water God's gonna trouble the water God's gonna trouble the water God's gonna trouble the water We come now to the time in our worship service where we have the privilege of going before God in prayer. Will you join me now as we pray together? Holy and loving God, we thank you that you have called us to be your people. We thank you for the hope that comes from knowing that there is nothing we can do that would make you stop loving us. Thank you that through the waters of baptism, you have initiated us into a new life and washed away our sin. God, we know that you have blessed us so that we can bless the world. So hear us now as we pray for our world. We pray for our community, right here in Wrightsville Beach and beyond in Wilmington. Lord, we pray for all of our leaders. Would you guide them and help them to do your will? We pray for the world we pray especially for Pastor David and the mission team serving in Sri Lanka. 
We pray for especially the people of Ukraine and for all places that are dealing with poverty and war. We pray for those who are struggling with their physical or their mental health. We pray for those who are grieving or lonely. And we pray for those we know and are particularly concerned about. And we name them before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. And God, we pray for your church. Help us to have the boldness to live in the countercultural ways that you have called us to. We pray especially for this community of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. God, give us the strength to live out our baptismal vows. And now, God, help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now into a time of generosity and reflection, I'd just like to remind you that you can always give to the mission of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through the mail, our website, and our smartphone app. Let us now continue to worship God. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today in church, we're going to do something called remembering your baptism. Do you know what the word baptism means? It's kind of a fancy big church word, but maybe you know that you were baptized or maybe you have a little brother or sister who was baptized. When someone's baptized, their parents bring them to the church and they come to this, which is called a font, which is a special word. And the pastor prays for them and pours water over their head and says that they're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What baptism really means is that God loves us and that God has chosen us to be his children forever and forever and forever. And that no matter what, there's nothing we can do that will mean that God wouldn't love us. We have the water on us as kind of a sign of this. You know what it kind of reminds me of is like having a stamp. When we have the water poured over us, it's almost like God is taking us and putting a big stamp on us, just like that, that says, I love you and you're mine. But you know, even though I have this stamp, I'll probably in a little bit wash my hands and you know, probably by tomorrow, you won't be able to see it anymore. But with baptism, it's permanent. It never goes away. It never stops being able to mean something to God. So even though you grow up, your baptism still stays. So I want you to remember today that God loves you no matter what, and God will always be with you. Let's say a prayer. God, thank you for the gift of baptism. Thank you for making us your own. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. 
and I'm really glad that you took time to worship with us today. We're beginning a new series during the season of Epiphany. It's called A Sure and Certain Hope. And so you're going to be hearing uh, sermons based on texts that deal with hope as we start this new year. And today, um, that's going to start at what I might say is kind of our foundational beginning, baptism. And we're going to look at Jesus' baptism according to Luke chapter 3. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John the Baptist, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Most holy and gracious God, we thank you that you would call us beloved like your son Jesus. Lord, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are truly our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you've been watching the news, water's been in the news a lot lately, um, at least in the forms of snow and ice. Winter storms and snows literally stopped traffic in many parts of the country during the Christmas break, forcing lots of people to stay inside. Now it's rainwater that's washed out roads in the western sections of our country. You know, water is part of the drama of life, and we've got to respect it. It brings life, but if we don't get enough or if we get too much, it can be destructive. We've seen that right here in Wilmington with various hurricanes through the years. But today I want to focus on the life-giving power of a clean, fresh water through the sacrament of holy baptism. You know, there are two ways to think about baptism. The first approach recognizes the time of baptism as a saving moment in which the person being baptized accepts the love and forgiveness of God. The person then considers herself saved. She may grow in faith through the years, but nothing which she will experience after her baptism will really be as important as the moment of her baptism. She'll always be able to recall her baptism as the time when her life changed. Well, the second approach doesn't disagree with any of that, but it would add to it rather significantly. This idea also affirms that baptism is the time when God's love and forgiveness are experienced, it also recognizes baptism as a time of change. However, where the first approach isolates the act of baptism as the most important moment, the second approach understands baptism more as a starting point. That's why it doesn't matter how old we are when we're baptized. While it's true that in the waters of baptism, God has laid claim on our lives, it is also true that we're going to spend the rest of our lives trying to live out what that means. The first understanding often overlooks the journey that follows. You see, baptism is not really the culmination of our faith. It's the starting point. Baptism too frequently carries the connotation of having arrived. Uh, every now and again, somebody will come up to a minister and say, I want to be baptized and join the church just as soon as I get my life in order. Well, <laughs> if that's what we're waiting on, I'm not sure any of us would get baptized. None of, us, none of us would have our lives sufficiently in order to get baptized. You see, baptism's not actually something we earn, nor is, a, is it a sign that we've now found all the answers. Really nothing could be further from the truth. Instead, baptism is a beginning. It's a starting point. It's a desire to see the world differently, to see each other differently, maybe even to see ourselves differently. Baptism is a fresh start. It's not a destination. Baptism calls into question our previous lives. It doesn't bless it. It's not a 
trial-free membership, but rather the right of initiation into a way of life in which Jesus promised, well, there would still be trials. Jesus' baptism serves as a model for our own baptism. For Jesus, baptism represents the beginning of His ministry too. While some ultimate questions may have been answered at the River Jordan there when John the Baptist baptized his cousin, Jesus continues to deal with questions and temptations the rest of his life, even right up to the very end. The baptism of Jesus, though, is such a cool story. In fact, it might be one of our favorite stories. We love to hear how the heavens are opened, you know. We imagine the dove descending, hearing God's blessing on the sun. We'd like to think that maybe something like that happens at our own baptism, right? Um, But what we should be prepared for is that our journey of faith, just like Jesus' journey, is going to continue to unfold long after our baptism as we try to discern what it means for our daily lives. I think we can begin to understand more about our baptism by thinking of it in three ways today. That first, as I've already insinuated, Baptism is about starting anew. It's a fresh start, even when we're fairly comfortable and satisfied with our lives. Paul said we emerge from baptism to walk in newness of life in Romans chapter 6. I like that, to walk in newness of life. You know, there are two ways to make something new. One, you start with nothing and you create something. Or you can start with what you already have and turn that into something new. That's baptism. It transforms our lives, and we think, speak, and act in ways that represent to the world the image of Jesus. Baptism, you see, it it transforms us. It transforms our stinginess into generosity, our narrow-mindedness into thoughtful consideration. It transforms our prejudice into love. Baptism transforms our fear of one another into a desire for true community. It transforms our suspicious motives into open and honest dialogue. It transforms our hesitancy into boldness. Baptism transforms not just individuals, but groups of people. It transforms them into churches. It transforms gatherings into a family of brothers and sisters. It transforms church services into passionate worship. Now, does all that immediately happen the moment you're baptized? No. But these are the kind of things that happen throughout our lives as we continue to be open to what baptism means to us. The Christian life at its best is an ongoing transformation in which we continue to be shaped by the presence of Jesus Christ in us. The second part of baptism is the good news that we've been included. I mean, how many of us go through lives, you know, thinking that maybe we're outsiders or we're not good enough, we're not cool enough, you know, that there's this other group out there. Reminds me of one of my favorite television shows of all time, The Andy Griffith Show. Anybody ever watch The Andy Griffith Show? I used to watch it constantly when I was a kid. Um, you, if you know the story, I mean, you, you know that it's set in the fictional town of Mayberry, North Carolina. And, and those who grew up on the show like I did, you might remember the episode in, when, in which the uh, Women's Historical Society has discovered that there's a living descendant of a Revolutionary War hero living right here in Mayberry. Well, the news generates excitement and curiosity throughout the town as... People made plans for recognizing the hero's relative. Deputy Barney Fife, of course, twisted his own family tree to the point that he put himself in line for the honor. The rest of the townspeople felt special just because someone among them was related to this hero. But everyone was shocked when the news finally came. A careful analysis of the genealogical records determined that the hero's descendant was none other than Otis Campbell, the town 'er ne'er-do-well. Well, despite instructions to go find a substitute Otis for the presentation, the real Otis showed up for the ceremony. And when the ladies gave him the plaque which they had engraved especially for him, 
Otis then gave the plaque back to the town. He said, just because you're the descendant of a hero doesn't make you one. So I want to present this plaque to the town of Mayberry, to which I'm just proud to belong. Aren't we all proud to belong? Aren't we all just happy to be included? We can refer to this part of our baptism as incorporation. We are incorporated into the body of Jesus Christ. This incorporation came about as a result of a love that was determined to draw us in. You see, God moved toward us before our baptism took place, and He is the main actor even in our baptisms. He's the one pouring out His love through the water. And long after the act of baptism, God's love holds us together. Without ranking us any more or less important than anyone else, it allows us to disagree with each other without deserting one another. It leads us to use our different gifts without needing to compare them to somebody else's gifts. Our baptism, it's personal, sure, but it's, it's never private. We are included alongside others and, and serve in this rite of initiation into the church. The waters of baptism are not only symbolic of being cleansed from sin, but also of the power that it has to break down barriers between people. We share a common relationship in that we share a common relationship with Jesus Christ in which all old divisions and designations no longer apply. You know, no male nor female, no Jew nor Greek, right? no slave nor free. And while this part of baptism can be called incorporation, it's easy to also see how transformation is necessary in order for us to live with all who've been included by God's love. Because sometimes that's not so easy. See, baptism is not about being incorporated into the body of Christ without any intention of living and working with the others who are in that body. That's why we do it in front of the whole church. As we're included alongside others, we realize for the body to be health, healthy, we're all going to have to be transformed. So we make a pledge to help the newly baptized by surrounding them with love and forgiveness. And as we ourselves are transformed by loving and forgiving others, then we're more likely to expand the circle to include other people. It's a pretty cool thing, being included. The third part of baptism is commissioning. With baptism comes the Spirit, and with the Spirit come spiritual gifts to be used in the service of God. When Lindsay Davis was elected bishop in the United Methodist Church, he reminded his listeners of the basis for ministry. He said, it isn't ordination or consecration, but baptism that makes us servants of Christ and his church. We too often view ministry as that which the minister does. But ministry is the work in which all baptized believers engage in a response to the call and claim of God on their lives. It was baptism that served as the commissioning for Jesus. That was marked the beginning of his ministry. Now in our time, we ordain ministers, but we sometimes forget that it's baptism that shapes our lives and convicts us towards service. When we enter the household of God, we do so with a vocation. That belief that God has called us to some type of particular work that will utilize our special gifts in building up the body and making this a better world. To understand baptism as a commissioning for all Christians, it's, it's not some ploy that ministers use to try to get church members to do more work. In fact, the area in which your gifts may be the most useful may not even be in church. You might find that your gift is teaching a young child to read. Another person's gift may be helping the homeless to find a decent place to live. Someone else's gift may be visiting with those who are homebound or in a nursing home. Baptism comes with a vocation that shouldn't be a burden. When seen through the lens of baptism, our work is a joyful response to the love that God has poured into us. The old radio host Garrison Keillor likes to tell the story of Larry the Sad Boy. Larry the Sad Boy was saved 12 times which is an all-time record in the Lutheran church. 
In the Lutheran church, there is no altar call, no organist playing just as I am, and no minister with shiny hair manipulating the congregation. These are Lutherans, Keeler says, and they repent the same way they sin, discreetly and tastefully. Keeler writes, granted, we've been born in original sin and we're worthless and vile, but 12 conversions is too many. God didn't mean for us to feel guilty our whole life. Keeler says, there comes a point when you should dry your tears and join the building committee and start grappling with the problems of the church furnace and the church roof and make church coffee and be of use. So yes, baptism is a commissioning, a call to serve. And when we serve, we will encounter others who have been incorporated into this body. And we'll be challenged to see how our gifts complement the gifts of others. And also as we work side by side, we're going to find that our humility and our gentleness and our patience and our kindness may be tested from time to time. In those moments, we will realize that our transformation is also still in process and that we must not give up on it. But in all these things, baptism is the beginning. Stories told of a pastor's words to a baby shortly after he baptized her. No doubt the minister was speaking as much to the congregation as to the infant. Little sister, he said, by this act of baptism, we welcome you to a journey that will take your whole life. This isn't the end. It's the beginning of God's experiment with you. What God will make of you, we know not. Where God will take you, we cannot say. It may surprise you. But this we do know. And this we can say with full confidence. That God is with you. And God will be with us too. As we live out our baptisms. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God. We thank you that you have laid a claim on our lives through the waters of baptism. That you poured your Holy Spirit into us, giving us gifts to help build up the body. Lord, continue to transform us and transform our church as we learn how to work together using all of these spiritual gifts for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, your answer is, we do. We do. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you? We do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Do you? We do. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, your answer is we will. We will. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water, and after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Spirit. 
He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water wherever it is that we are, wherever it is that we might be remembering our baptism. Bless this gift as a call to our remembrance of the grace declared to us in our own baptisms. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and raising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Julia, I invite you to remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be grateful. Amen. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. Let us pray. We give thanks for all that God has given us this day and as members of the body of Christ and in this congregation here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We pledge that we will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. May the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Remember your baptism. Remember you were baptized. And be thankful. And may the Holy Spirit work within you. That being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you are.